year is 1970, the week, August 16th to August 22nd. Hi, I'm your host, Rick Cole, and you are listening to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast. Every week, I take you on a trip down memory lane, back 50 years, where we discuss all the hockey and sporting news from that time period. Our podcast is made possible each week by the support of our two sponsors. Newspapers.com is the world's largest online newspaper archive, and their support's been crucial to our research. They enable us to uh, access all the news stories from the 1970s. We're also sponsored by the Breakwall Brewing Company, located in beautiful downtown Port Coburn, Ontario. The folks at the Breakwall produce outstanding craft beers, many crafted from recipes that were actually made in the late 1800s in the first breweries in our small town. Just the other day, I had a pint of their maple lager, and that particular brew is one of those original recipes. When we are returning back to somewhat normal times, I'd love to meet any of our listeners for a beer and a burger at the break wall. Before we get uh, started this week, we have some exciting news we want to pass along to you. We are expanding our podcast activities to provide some very interesting content during the upcoming hockey season. We're planning a series of special content bonus episodes where we'll cover a variety of subjects in a little more depth than we normally are allowed to do during our short weekly podcast. Uh, These uh, Subjects, well, most of course, will deal with hockey history, especially from our period of 50 years ago. And uh, we'll also have some news and other sports and whatever else catches our fancy along the way. We'll have episodes with the complete interviews we have recorded with special guests, including those we provided in clips during podcast shows this summer. We'll also have shows where we take a very deep dive into some subjects we've touched on already. We want to talk a lot more about the efforts of baseball player Kurt Flood to get the reserve clause eliminated from contracts of professional athletes, including the court decisions which were made along the way and the reasoning behind them. These stories by some of the top sports journalists in the world in 1970. We'll also do full features on players from this and other eras and uh, we also want to take a closer look at the media and how they covered hockey and sports in general and how that has changed in the last half century and also how it's affected the coverage we enjoy in the present time. These bonus episodes will be available to those who subscribe to our podcast via our new Patreon account. This account will enable listeners to have early access to each week's episode and to all the special and extra episodes we produce. And these should be about two to three shows every month. Don't worry, though. The regular weekly episode of 50 Years Ago in Hockey will continue in its current format and will always be free each Friday with no subscription needed. If you're interested, our Patreon account can be found at www.patreon.com slash hockey 50 years. Thanks so much, everyone. Now let's get to the rest of this week's show. Last week, we had some interesting stories for you. We talked about the new Buffalo Sabres NHL team establishing a farm team in probably one of the unlikeliest of places, according to some people. Salt Lake City, Utah. We had some news on that plan to fly fans from Edmonton to each Vancouver Canucks game every week and how that might be hitting a snag. And we also got to the bottom of reports that Boston Bruins captain Johnny Busick suffered a serious leg injury when he fell out of a boat. And thankfully, the story was completely wrong and it was nothing quite as serious as was first reported. This week... NHL training camps are coming closer just a few weeks away now and the teams were getting ready more preparations and we had some uh, interesting stories coming up this week. Uh, we we uh, will talk about Derek Sanderson of the Boston Bruins. He wants a big new contract. He signed a three, three year deal when he first came into the league as a rookie. Now he wants a lot more money and there are indications that the Bruins 
are uh, running out of patience with Derek. They're getting tired of his act. The issue of indemnification of the Western Hockey League by the NHL and the Vancouver Canucks for invading their territory continues uh, with figures up to over a million dollars being talked about. And we'll have a a little bit of news from Lefty Reed, who in 1970 was the curator of the Hockey Hall of Fame located at the Canadian National Exhibition Grounds in Toronto. Uh, Lefty will talk about a great new exhibit featuring Bobby Orr memorabilia and some other renovations to the hallowed hall. Lots of other hockey news as well, so let's get to it. We start off this week with the news and notes from around the hockey world. And first of all, we have Jim Proudfoot of the Toronto Star reporting that the cast has been taken off Montreal Canadian defenseman Serge Savard's broken left legs. It's been off for a few days, actually, and Serge is telling people that he expects to miss the first month of the Montreal Canadian schedule as he rehabs that leg to get back in top shape. Serge initially said he'd be ready to go at training camp and wouldn't miss any time, but I think he's uh, taking a more realistic outlook. This is going to be a lot tougher to rehab than Serge originally thought. Proudfoot also mentioned that Boston lawyer Bob Wolf has been negotiating with the Montreal Canadiens on behalf of two of the Habs' first round picks from the June draft this year. That is forward Chuck Lefley and goalie Ray Martiniak. Ray is out of Western Canada, and the scouts are raving about this young goalkeeper. They're say, saying he is the best young netminder to come along in years, and big things are expected of this young man. Now, don't forget, the Habs also have former Cornell University and Canadian national team goalkeeper turning professional this year as well, but they're not really counting too heavily on, on Ken Dryden. There are many who feel that Dryden could excel against college and international amateurs, but stopping professional shooters is a whole different ball game and one that might be just too tough for the tall Toronto native who's basically been against college shooters who are well known to be not quite as accurate as those in major junior hockey where Ken declined to participate as he got his degree at Cornell. We'll see what happens with Ken Dryden. One more Canadian's note, and it also uh, talks about a goalkeeper, and that is uh, young Phil Mir. The Canadians announced that Mir signed a contract this week. He's a graduate of the Ontario Hockey Association Junior A Niagara Falls Flyers, but he is a native of Quebec, and he's expected to challenge Rogatiam Dashan for the number one net mining slot with the Habs this season. The Canadians and GM Sam Pollock pretty much consider Mir the Habs' goalie of the future, and his pro career will probably get off to a rousing start this season. We have news from out west, the Vancouver Canucks. Bud Poyle, the Canucks general manager, says that although the team has signed only four players at this point in the summer, he anticipates no trouble in signing all the rest except for one player. Bud says the initial asking price of big defenseman Pat Quinn, who was drafted from Toronto, is far too rich for his liking, way too much for a player of Quinn's caliber. And he won't be paying that kind of money, although no figures have been mentioned, for a player who brings what Pat Quinn brings to the table. Pat Quinn is a very bright guy. People think he's just one of those big, thick-headed defensemen, but Quinn is a very smart person, and he's studying to get a law degree. I think Pat Quinn is probably negotiating for himself, and he's given Bud Poyle all he can handle. Canucks have also invited two players from Finland to their training camp, and both Lasse Oksanen and Jormo Paltonen have indicated that they will report to camp, and it's been learned that the two have retained an unnamed Toronto lawyer to handle their contract negotiations. Doesn't look like it's Alan Eagleson. Of course, Bobby Orr is up. 
agent, but it is a lawyer that lives in Toronto, and he's going to be talking to Bud Poyle instead of the two Finns. And that is undoubtedly going to make Poyle happy, as like most of the NHL general managers here in 1970, they don't like the mouthpieces representing the players. Makes their job a little tougher. Finally, after lots of speculation, the Canucks have awarded their radio broadcasting rights for all home and away games to radio station CKNW in Vancouver for this season. There's no word yet as the announcement was made on who would do the play-by-play, but everyone wondered how could it be anyone else than the great Jim Robson. A radio station's management would only say that Robson would be a prime candidate to be the play-by-play man, but they weren't making any firm commitment as the announcement was made initially. But a couple days later, Jim Robson was indeed named as the man who would give the play-by-play commentary for the station for the Canucks this season, and everyone was really happy about that. Here's another media rumor uh, from Vancouver, and this one's uh, a bit crazy. It's said that radio station CJOR is going to hire former Western Hockey League Canucks general manager coach Joe Crozier, and he will turn up as the station's prime hockey reporter. Now, Joe, as you remember, was unceremoniously dumped by the NHL Canucks after they were awarded the franchise. Crozier was thought to be a shoe-in as the Canucks' first general manager, but he did something to really tick off the uh, new Canucks ownership, and he was let go. Joe, as you know, is a very good friend of the new Buffalo general manager, Coach Punch Imlach, and many thought he would show up in the Buffalo organization in one capacity or another, but as of yet, Joe doesn't have a job in hockey. We know he won't be doing anything. Joe doesn't need the money. He's very well off financially, and a gig on a radio station might just be up Joe's alley. I know Crozier would enjoy being on the airwaves, taking a shot at his former employers. Here's a little note that's uh, likely to go over like a lead balloon in Boston. There is now in Boston Garden for the upcoming season, a no smoking rule. It'll be interesting to see how the gallery gods in Boston react to that one. Here's a news item that a lot of people in 1970 might have missed. The Oakland Seals are no more. They no longer exist. No, the team has not finally mercifully mercifully folded or moved to an actual hockey city. Owner Charles O. Finley, new owner Charles O. Finley, has simply decided he's going to change the name of the team, although he hasn't cleared this with anybody else in the NHL. Finley has now decreed that the team will be known as the Bay Area Seals. Sounds a little more like a roller derby name, doesn't it? Speaking of the Seals, coach Freddie Glover expects a lot of competition at this year's training camp, which begins on September 10th in Oshawa, Ontario. Now, Glover was really upset with his team last year. He said there were too many fat cats, too many veteran players who figured they didn't have to compete with the jobs, and neither did they want to give any help to aspiring young players who were trying to make the team last year. Glover says that he expects at least 60, that's six zero players, to show up for the SEALs training camp. And that's the most ever in the team's brief history. You can bet he's going to work these players hard and he's expecting much better results from the SEALs this season. Of course, he'd better get much better results. Charles O. Finley doesn't strike anyone as as a patient sort of guy, and he'll want to see improvement in his brand new hockey team very quickly. A little bit of off-the-ice news for a very prominent National Hockey League player this week. Adirondack Industries is a company that makes baseball bats and hockey sticks. This week, they brought in a new advisor to help them 
make the best hockey sticks possible, and that would be New York Rangers defenseman Brad Park. I wonder if Brad will be uh, testing out the Adirondack sticks over the noggins of opposing forwards this year. We'll have to look and see what sticks Brad used when he's on the ice and what kind of success he has with them. Here's a little bit of news revealed by Chicago Blackhawks coach Billy Ray over some Irish stew and beverages at the well-known Chicago restaurant Corona where he had dinner with Ted DeMata of the Chicago Tribune. Golfer Ray Floyd is apparently a big hockey fan and a very avid skater. Ray, often with Billy's permission of course, shows up at Chicago Blackhawks Workhouse at Chicago Stadium, goes on the ice and skates with the team. Ray said he was amazed that a guy who makes a hot couple of hundred thousand dollars a year on the professional golf tour ventures out onto the ice with the pros without any equipment save gloves and a stick. He doesn't even wear elbow pads. Ray Floyd, pretty uh, gutsy guy for a golfer. And here's another uh, news note that ties in hockey and golf again, and a strange one indeed. 16 National Hockey League players have been declared golf professionals and have lost their amateur status. The interesting part is none of these guys have applied to become professionals. None of them particularly want to be. How could this even happen? Well, it seems that the past couple of summers, the players in question competed in the American Airlines National Hockey League Players Golf Tournaments. Uh, This year's tournament was held at the Board of Trade Country Club, a very posh institution just north of the city of Toronto, I think near Woodbridge. The winning players in the tournament accepted cash prizes from American Airlines. Among those who are now considered professional golfers are Frank Mahovlich and Gary Bergman, who were this year's winners, and last year's champs Bobby Bond and Gump Worsley. Each received $2,500 for their efforts, and Mahovlich also won a car for his closest to the pin achievement on the 16th hole at the Board of Trade Country Club. Other players who were named professionals were Billy Hickey, Gary Jarrett, and Harry Howell of the Oakland Seals, Jim McKenney, Jacques Plante, and Mike Walton of the Maple Leafs, Murray Oliver and Danny O'Shea of the North Stars, Ed Van Imp of the Flyers, and Roger Bear of the New York Rangers. And we have a quick social note for you. Boston Bruins forwards Johnny McKenzie and Eddie Westfall and their wives are vacationing at the French Riviera this summer, uh, but they're expected to return back to North America by August 27th to begin workouts for the Bruins training camp, which is opening in September in London, Ontario. The Bruins also announced quite the exhibition game slated for October 3rd at that new smokeless Boston Garden. And the exhibition game will be between their uh, top farm team, the Central Hockey League Oklahoma City Blazers and the American Hockey League Providence Reds. The Bruins say their top rookie prospects will all be in the Oklahoma City lineup, giving hub fans a look at the Bruins' future right up close. Players who are expected to suit up for the Blazers in this game will be right winger Reggie Leach, defenseman Ron Plum, left winger Rick McLeish, defenseman Bob Stewart, goalie Danny Bouchard, and college drag graduate Paul Hurley, he's a defenseman as well. With this is a core of young players that would give the Bruins a pretty bright future for an already powerful team. We also had an interview this week uh, put out by hockey writer Stan Fischler uh, with the former Bruins coach Harry Sinden. Now, Sinden apparently told Fischler that he will not return to the National Hockey League under any circumstances, although he did say he misses hockey mightily and he might accept the position as a color commentator with the CBC's Hockey Night in Canada program just to stay close to the sport 
with a once a week offering probably during intermissions on those Saturday night games out of Toronto. Here's a little insight into how the mind uh, of Los Angeles Kings owner Jack Kent Cook works. This is his, his management style. Gives you a good idea of what his employees have to put up with as they work for the Kings. During the uh, recent National Hockey League meetings in Montreal in June, uh, Cook, of course, was there and he was flitting around the meetings, talking to everyone and asking the question to almost everyone he met whether his coach, Johnny Wilson, was more like Vince Lombardi, football coach of the Green Bay Packers, or another football coach, the Los Angeles Rams, George Allen. He Cook wanted to know which of those two, Wilson, was more like. A lot of people uh, just give Jack a uh, quizzical look and walked away. After all his conversations, Cook concluded that Johnny Wilson had the best qualities of both of those esteemed coaches. Then a few weeks later, he went out and fired him. Go figure. That's Jack Kent Cook. How can the Kings ever be a success with this guy running that franchise? The Kings also announced four player signings this week. They were uh, really actually pretty important players to this club. Center Butch Goring, right winger Bill Cowboy Flett, defenseman newly acquired Matt Ravlich, and Gilles Murat, Captain Crunch, another defenseman. And these guys pretty well formed the core of this Kings team, and they're all under contract and happy for the upcoming season. The Kings general manager and now new coach, Larry Regan, says that he is working on some kind of a deal to trade Eddie Shack. Regan says he feels it can make a good deal for Eddie the Entertainer, and there are rumors that the Vancouver Canucks are interested. The Vancouver Canucks coach is Hal Laco, and uh, he knows Eddie Shack pretty well. Remember, Hal coached the Kings for the first third of the 1969-70 season before he was unceremoniously dumped by Jack Kent Cook and Regan. Well, during the time that Eddie Shack played for Hal Laco, he scored seven goals in 24 games for the Kings, and he actually had a really good start last season for Los Angeles. Laco says he likes Eddie. He can uh, motivate Eddie. He can keep him in line. And what a crowd draw. Eddie would be playing in Vancouver. It looks to us like a match made in heaven. Eddie Shack playing for a new expansion team on Canada's West Coast. One more note from the Kings. They uh, announced this week, uh, a bit of a media note, this is actually. They have a new color commentary man for the radio and TV broadcasts, and he is a fellow by the name of Gary Morrell. He'll work with the Kings play-by-play -play man, the great Jiggs McDonald. Gary succeeds a fellow by the name of Dan Avery, who moved on to become the Los Angeles Kings Director of Advertising. The Ontario Hockey Association Junior A Series confirmed this week that there will be no East-West meeting for the Junior Hockey Championship of Canada next spring. The Ontario Hockey Association approved a lengthened schedule for the upcoming season, which will leave no time for an extended playoff season. This was met with uh, disdain by people in the West, of course. Edmonton Oil Kings general manager, part owner Bill Hunter, said the move by the OHA is simply a veiled threat designed to gain Eastern juniors more concessions by the West. The East Leagues, Quebec and Ontario, do not like the fact that the Western juniors are allowed to use over-age players during the Memorial Cup uh, playoffs, and also they have a few other rules that favor them that the East says gives them an unfair advantage. They're having none of it, and as far as they're concerned, there will be no Memorial Cup awarded this season. We'll see how this actually plays out, but right now, lengthening that schedule certainly diminishes any chance of a more Memorial Cup final taking place next spring. 
the Minnesota North Stars have announced uh, a signing, and this is defenseman Ted Harris. And a lot of people are saying, so what? He's not a big star. This is a very sign, uh, important signing for Minnesota North Stars general manager, Ren Blair. Harris brings a winning attitude and an element of toughness that the North Stars simply haven't had in the past in their first three NHL seasons. Harris was acquired this summer from the Montreal Canadiens in that very complicated, convoluted trade that saw Claude LaRose end up back in Montreal and Bobby Russo and young Jude Druin ended up with the North Stars along now with Harris. The Philadelphia Flyers have made a straight cash deal with the Baltimore Clippers of the American Hockey League, sending young defenseman Paul Cates, who played for the Quebec Aces of the American Hockey League last season, to the Clippers for an undisclosed amount of cash. The Detroit Red Wings made a similar transaction, but this involved a veteran defenseman, fellow by the name of Irv Spencer, who first got his chance in the NHL, actually, in the 1950s. Irv is going to the Western Hockey League, San Diego goals, for that undetermined amount of cash. Uh, Irv is pretty happy about this, and who wouldn't be? Playing hockey in San Diego all winter? I could certainly stand something like that. Had one more cash transaction between a minor pro team and an NHL club. This is the Phoenix Roadrunners of the Western Hockey League announced the acquisitions of forwards Pat Hannigan and Ted McCaskill from the NHL Vancouver Canucks and both again undisclosed amounts of cash going to the Canucks for these two players who should really help Phoenix, although I, I would say Pat Hannigan is nearing the end of his career. Pat Hannigan's a great guy, and we think he'd have a future in broadcasting if he wanted it after he hangs up his skates. Another a minor hockey, uh, prof- minor professional hockey note, there will be no professional hockey this season in Houston, Texas. The city was trying to acquire a team in the Eastern Hockey League, Houston in the East, well, that's what they were trying to do. They had a general manager, a fellow by the name of Herb Elk, and he said that the proposed Houston team for the EHL was rejected by the the league governors in a meeting this past week. Uh, That just might be the end of any kind of pro hockey in that Texas city, as even the lowest minor leagues don't seem to be interested in Houston. And yet the NHL, when they talk about new franchises, always brings up the city of Houston and always seems like Houston probably will be one of those NHL destinations at some point in time. Maybe Houston just won't uh, support anything other than big league hockey. Well, we'll see. I don't know. The NHL always mentions... Places like Houston and Seattle, it can be only a matter of time before the NHL governors soak them for some big bucks to put a franchise in those city. Whether they're successful, that's anybody's guess these days. Toronto Maple Leafs captain Davey Keon is skating again at his hockey school, but that's not really news at any other time, but it is this week, and no one really knew why. It was learned that Dave was not very active this summer because he had an operation to repair a hernia right after the hockey season ended. Dave, of course, is a very private person, keeps things to himself, and no one knew that Dave was in the hospital recovering from that hernia surgery. Well, he seems to be all better, and the way he was moving at the hockey school in Toronto this week, it looks like Dave Keon is ready for a big season. We'll see how Dave goes this year. This should be a big one for the Maple Leafs, who try and rebound from just an awful year last year. The St. Louis Blues made a player signing this week, and this is another one of those many college players that are getting a shot at the NHL. This is Toronto native left winger George Morrison, who played for Denver University. And George twice led the Western Collegiate Hockey Association in goals two years in a row, and he might be just the ticket to provide the Blues with some much-needed offensive punch from the left side this season. 
Another note from the National Hockey League. The National Hockey League announced this week that the 1971 All-Star Game will be held at Boston Garden. Will this be a continuation of the uh, practice they've had for years with the All-Star Game being held in the rink of the Stanley Cup winning team? If that's what the NHL is going to do, they got away from that once with St. Louis, but now they're right back to the to the Stanley Cup winners in Boston. You might not see uh, expansion teams get many All-Star games in the near future. We'll see how this one goes into the future. But this year, the smokeless Boston Garden will be the site of the uh, All-Star game in January. One of the more prominent National Hockey League stories this week was the difficulty the Boston Bruins are having in signing center Derek Sanderson. Now, Derek has established for himself a reputation as a hard-nosed two-way center, but he's also widely considered a problem child for the Bruins with disciplinary issues and a very questionable lifestyle. He hangs out with the New York Jets uh, quarterback, Joe Namath is a partner in the Bachelors 3 bar in uh, New York City, which has con- come under considerable scrutiny by the commissioners of the various sports from the uh, people involved. Uh, Kevin Walsh, the highly respected hockey writer for the Boston Globe, reports that the Bruins are quickly becoming quite disenchanted with Derek Sanderson, especially in the light of his recent contract demands. Walsh says that it's no secret around the National Hockey League that Boston has been trying to swap Sanderson away and one team involved in the talks for sure is the Detroit Red Wings and that was widely reported that right after the season finished the Bruins are said to have offered Sanderson to the Red Wings in a straight up swap for another young center who would be the star young mod dressing star Gary Unger. Unger is a very fashionable young man, likes the nightlife, but he is nowhere near the class of Derek Sanderson in how he conducts his off-ice activities. Unger is a much more talented in the offensive uh, categories than Sanderson, and he would be a big upgrade to an already tough Bruins team who might probably be able to develop another defensive-minded center. Uh, He likes the mod lifestyle, like everyone said, but Gary is far too valuable to the Wings to be sent packing for a player like Sanderson. The Wings don't need those kind of headaches, and I could never see Sanderson getting along with uh, Coach Ned Harkness. But then again, Unger probably won't get along well with Harkness either, and this is probably why the Red Wings might have even considered it, but that deal wasn't made. Now, Bruins general manager Milt Schmidt He wouldn't name names. He just said that both Detroit and the Rangers turned down substantial offers, what he considered good trade offers, to get Sanderson. Kevin Walsh said that the deal with the Rangers would have brought center Walter Kachuk to Boston in a straight swap for Sanderson, and Rangers general manager Emil Francis did not want to make that deal. Kachuk is, a, is what they call a solid citizen in hockey. He quietly goes about his business. No fanfare, no controversy, just good, solid, two-way hockey. Emil Francis didn't need the headache that is Derek Sanderson either. What apparently has Schmidt so very upset with Sanderson is that Derek has been going around telling anyone who will listen that he is vastly underpaid by the Bruins. And it is kind of true. Derek originally signed a three-year uh, contract when he was a rookie that paid him uh, sums of ten, twelve, and $13,000 a year in his first three years. Those are bargain basement prices for a talented young center like Sanderson. But Milt Schmidt was quick to point out that Sanderson failed to disclose all the money that Boston has paid him, citing yearly five-figure bonuses that substantially raises Sanderson's yearly income. 
Milt also said that playoff and regular season bonuses added to those paid out by the team to Derek uh, ensure that Sanderson certainly is not any type of a poverty case by any stretch of the imagination. Sanderson is said to be asking for a cool $50,000 a year from the Bruins and the Bruins are fully expecting him to be a holdout once the Boston training camp opens in London, Ontario. Uh, there are even stories going around that Derek has other activities planned for September, and we'll have to see what those are, uh, and that they may be excuses for Derek not showing up at training camp. This is a story that's going to bear watches. Will the uh, young mod superstar cause the stead old NHL to amend its ways? Or will Derek Sanderson find himself dispatched to one of the expansion outposts, maybe? Charlie Finley would love a drawing card like Sanderson out in Oakland, but would he give up his best player, uh, somebody like Carl Vadney, to get the flamboyant Sanderson? Stay tuned. It's all going to unfold this fall. When the National Hockey League expanded into Buffalo and Vancouver starting this September, they took over territories that had, up until that point in time, been occupied by teams in the American and Western Hockey Leagues, respectively. The National Hockey League, as they had done in 1967, agreed to provide compensation for each of the two top minor professional leagues for invading their territory. However, what that compensation entails varies quite a bit from what the NHL and especially the uh, Western Hockey League feels the indemnification payments should amount to. A settlement was reached pretty quickly with the AHL over the uh, usurping of the Buffalo Bisons franchise, but that agreement was not made completely public. It has been reported that the cash amount was not as important to the American Hockey League as getting the NHL's blessing to establish teams in NHL cities such as Toronto, Boston, and Montreal. These uh, teams would serve as the top farm teams for their NHL clubs in the big league. The NHL also is reported to agree to have its member teams establish their top farm teams in other American Hockey League expansion cities such as Norfolk and Richmond, Virginia. The Western Hockey League, meanwhile, has taken a much more militant approach to an agreement with hockey's major league. This likely goes back to the early and mid-60s when the Western Hockey League was making noises about uh, declaring itself as hockey's second major league. They're still upset that the NHL uh, kind of put the kibosh on those plans by expanding into California with the two clubs, the Seals and the Kings, and then moving into Vancouver three years later. The WHL brass feels that the NHL owes them somewhere in the neighborhood of one to one and a half million dollars as indemnification for invading their sacred territory. The NHL has gone on record saying that this issue belongs solely to the Vancouver franchise and they're going to have to work it out with the WHL. The Canucks ownership, of course, has no intention of paying anything close to one and a half million dollars to a minor league without receiving any concrete benefits. And of course, the big problem in all this is that some lawyers are going to make some money out of this as the Western Hockey League has threatened to launch an antitrust lawsuit against the National Hockey League. And of course, that's going to be a very expensive proposition for both sides. But the Western Hockey League rejected the latest offer from the Canucks and President Gene Knisiewicz, that's president of the WHL, Gene Knisiewicz, he uh, said a counter offer said to be about $750 and $1 million must be accepted or the matter's going to end up in the courts. Here is uh, Knisiewicz's reasoning, and he's a Harvard grad. He, he uh, is a very bright guy. He said we'd be suing for damages. After all, when we lost Vancouver, we lost our best franchise. 
Now, Knisswich went on to say this is simply a case of big business monopolizing a field and refusing an adequate settlement to those harmed by their decisions. He said that uh, we know we have no legal grounds for preventing the NHL from expanding, but we do have grounds for getting an adequate settlement. Knisswich said the NHL has agreed that damages have been incurred because they already made an offer to the Western Hockey League, and we'd have to see how the Cana- or the courts would view this. Stan Fischler, of course, uh, had his say on this subject, and he said that the Western Hockey League is looking into uh, more of its own expansion in a similar manner as the American Hockey League. Stan says the cities being considered for Western Hockey League expansion are Tucson, Arizona, Albuquerque, New Mexico, San Jose, California, and Denver, Colorado. A Stan, Denver's already in the Western Hockey League. And in one other note, the uh, Western Hockey League's chairman of the board, Bob Breitbart, uh, confirmed that the league figure of 750 to $1 million is what they are looking for as compensation. Breitbart, though, said the chances of a lawsuit are minimal. He's still negotiating with the Canucks and the NHL, and he doesn't think there'll be an antitrust suit against the hockey's major league. There's a new display at the Hockey Hall of Fame these days, and it isn't an exhibit focused on the distant past as so many of the great displays in that a fine building are. Uh, In fact, it features hockey's newest and brightest star, Bobby Orr. The new display will be open to the public this week as the Canadian National Exhibition opens. And of course, as uh, most people know, the Hockey Hall of Fame building is located right on the CNE grounds near downtown Toronto. The curator of the Hockey Hall of Fame is a fellow by the name of Lefty Reed. Uh, He's a jack of all trades. He's also the secretary of the institution, a chief projectionist for the films that are shown there. And he's also the person who acquires most of the memorabilia that's on display. He's also overseen the remodeling and the updating of the Hall of Fame building on the exhibition grounds. And that has been considerable over the past year. The new Orr exhibition includes many of the trophies that Bobby has won throughout his hockey life, including the Robert F. Kennedy Award for 1970s Outstanding Athlete in the United States, and also a cup given to Bobby by the Massachusetts Governor John Volpe. There's also a plaque donated by the mayor of Perry Sound, which of course is Bobby's hometown, And they had a day for Bobby this past summer, as, of course, you've heard on this podcast. Another interesting aspect of the display is a complete photographic history of Bobby's life, which even includes a great shot of a six-year-old Bobby smiling into the lens of a camera. Another feature of the recent renovations to the hall is how the exhibitions are now arranged. In the past, they were all in rows or on a wall, much like the shelves of a grocery store. If one wanted to stop and examine the pieces more closely, that usually caused a huge traffic jam on the floor on busy days and during the Canadian National Exhibition, that's every day. Now the exhibits have been moved away from the walls and arranged a little more uh, sort of randomly and this has freed up the walls for more photographs uh, which are one of the more popular features of the hall and allowed floor traffic to move much more freely. Another Hall of Fame improvement this year is that the biographies of the honored members have been updated and the displays have been uh, printed with larger type making them a lot easier for patrons to read. Also this year, more films will be shown in the hall's second floor theater. And to appeal to folks other than hockey fans, a lot of these films will cover other sports and other historical subjects, although they'll try and have a hockey tie-in as much as they can. Lefty Reed also says that much more audio-visual content will be introduced at the hall in the future. 
I visited the hall every summer when my parents uh, made the 90-minute drive from where we lived to the Canadian National Exhibition. And my dad would always uh, take some time to get me in there. And one of my favorite features of those uh, visits was the uh, players who were represented all the NHL teams were at the hall. And you could actually get to talk to the players, ask them questions, and sign an autograph. I'll never forget Frank Mahovlich, Larry Hillman, and Yvonne Cornwaye signing the uh, signing papers for me when I went into the uh, CNE. Well, this year that's returning again, and even players from Vancouver and Buffalo will be available at the hall to chat with fans and sign autographs. And of course, what was great about this is that it was free. Yes, for the first time ever, though, the Hockey Hall of Fame, which admission price is absolutely zero, is going to try and raise some money. They've established a souvenir stand in the Hockey Hall of Fame to try and help defray the costs of the hall's operation. Again, this is something that's needed because the Hockey Hall of Fame admission price in 1970 is free, and we've got to keep something like this going especially in a building, in an environment like the CNE. So that, my friends, is our show this week, and we hope you've enjoyed it. There was a lot of hockey news taking place, and we had some interesting stories. Uh, What did we learn this week? Well, we learned more about Derek Sanderson asking for that big contract from the Boston Bruins, and it looks like the Bruins are running out of patience with Derek. We learned that the issue of indemnification of the Western Hockey League by the NHL and the Vancouver Canucks is nowhere near resolved, and we learned a bit about the improvements by the Hockey Hall of Fame from curator Leftley Reed and uh, a great new exhibit featuring Bobby Orr. Next week, we have uh, lots of more stories as the summer winds down for you. And here are three of the uh, news items we'll be looking at. The Red Wings, Coach Ned Harkness, they think a college guy might have some radical ideas. Well, here's one of them. He's talking about switching Gordie Howe to defense. Ned figures this is a really good idea. But will Gordie? We have news on the financial woes of the Pittsburgh Penguins, and it ain't good, folks. And there is word for sure that the National Hockey League will try the new free face-off rule in exhibition games, and goalies are not happy about this at all. And we'll have much, much more. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole, and I can't thank him enough for all the work he puts into this. You're going to see his talents even better on display with the new uh, bonus episodes that we're going to have for subscribers. He does a great job with this. The very popular Juno-nominated Toronto indie rock group, the Rural Alberta Advantage, provides our intro and exit music. And uh, if you ever get a chance to see them perform live, take advantage of it. They put on a great show. Other musical pieces and sound effects are by Andy Cole. And our research comes from files from the Toronto Star, the Toronto Globe and Mail, and of course, from many publications found at newspapers.com. You can find us on Twitter at at Hockey50Years and on Facebook under 50 Years Ago in Hockey. We also have our WordPress site, Hockey50YearsAgo.com. And you can get us as well on YouTube and anywhere that fine podcasts are found. Thanks again to everyone who tunes in every week. And on that note, we will see you next week. When the